the plate with Carl Wells. Hi there. On this episode of On the Plate, you'll hear a conversation I had with Greg Winter, founder of Dialogue Wines, one of Newfoundland and Labrador's up-and-coming wine agencies. If you've ever wondered what a wine agent or agency is all about, Greg is about to explain. I also got to taste one of the wines Greg Winter represents, and to hear about some of the gems of the Dialogue Wines portfolio. The sound of wine being poured. And Greg, tell me about this wine that you've just poured for us. So this wine, Carl, is called Nova 7, and it's from Benjamin Bridge Winery in the Gaspro Valley in Nova Scotia. Um, I think one of the things that makes it unique is that it's, it's all Nova Scotian grapes. And I think that if somebody told me a few years ago that uh, we'd be drinking wine and enjoying wines, um, that are all Nova Scotian grapes. Uh, I might believe them, but I don't think I'd believe they'd be any good. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, um, what what particular variety of wine or uh, of grape is this? Uh, Nova Seven is um, it's a blend of anywhere between, uh, depending on the vintage, uh, ten to, to fourteen different grapes. I think uh, it's really a, a bit of a, a winemaker's secret. Uh, <laughs> Uh, something called New York Muscat plays a significant role in the uh, in the blend, but I'm uh, assuming there are there are only certain types of grapes that will grow well in Nova Scotia in that climate. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The um, and Benjamin Bridge, I think, have done a really nice job in realizing that they need to grow grapes that are going to work for the, for a cool climate. So something like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, would just never ripen in that kind of climate. It's not it's not warm enough. It's not hot enough. The uh, uh, you don't have enough enough days in in the growing season to to fully ripen something like that. Um, so they had to be very selective over what they choose to make the best wine they can possibly make. And uh, you know you hear the word uh, terroir often in wine. Um, and, and, and just working with it as opposed to working against it. Now, uh, I'm just going to have a sniff here and... Mmm. I, I would say this smells very fruity. Yeah, I think so. I think there's definitely lots of red fruit on this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of struck as well by um, a floral component on this wine. Um, I think that one thing I like about this wine as well is that because Benjamin Bridge is a boutique wine producer, you know, they only make, um, I think about 10, 10 to 12,000 cases of wine per year, which is, you know, relatively small. Um, and it's a family owned operation and it's in a cool climate. You have a lot of vintage variation, even in Nova seven, which would be their, their flagship wine. So, you know, year to year, the wine is different. It is showing different components. And this is the, the 2015 that we're tasting here. And this has just been released. So this is only about the second or third time I've, I've tasted this one myself. It smells, um, if, if I could say, uh, sweet. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think. Uh, you know, I heard people say, well, you can't smell sweetness, but you can certainly smell something that gives you the perception or of sweetness. Or maybe it's that floral yeah. aroma. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, though. I, there is, if you know this, you think you are expecting something sweet on the palate, 100%. Um, and, and there is that, you know, this has a fair bit of residual sugar in it. Um, but I think when you taste it, you'll also notice that it makes your mouth water a little bit. It has that acidity to balance out the sugar which is important when you're talking about uh, a sweeter wine and, and pairing with food. And you hear people say, is the wine balanced? Uh, or this wine is very balanced. And that's, that, that's sort of what you're looking for. If, you're, if you notice the sweetness, hopefully there's something there to sort of balance that out. Okay, so I'm gonna taste sweet. I'm gonna taste this now. I'm sure. gonna taste sweet and slightly acidic, mm -hmm. you say. And you'll feel the acid on the sides of your tongue there. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. and, and Definitely sweet. Definitely sweet. Lots of residual. So, so for anybody who doesn't like dry white wine, this is the wine for them. I think that this product speaks to the palates of a lot of people in Atlantic Canada, who who really just enjoy a sweeter styled wine. Uh, yeah, and 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 I'm just thinking as well, Greg. This would make a great summer quaffing wine out on the deck, you know, maybe before dinner. Well, I'm, I'm just hoping that we have those days <laughs> this, uh, this yeah. summer. But yeah, I think you're, you're right there as well, Carl. Um, 
a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of Nova 7, I think, is a, is a wonderful pairing. Well, uh, we're going to get, you have some other wines here from Dialogue, which we're going to get to in a second. But first, Greg, tell us about Dialogue Wines. What exactly is Dialogue Wines? Dialogue Wines, essentially, we are a wine agent. Uh, and what that means, and uh, I think it's a good question, because a lot of people don't understand that part of the business. And they assume that agents work for the NLC or something to that effect, which, you know, is, is not true at all. Um, wine agents or wine brokers, and there are several of us around. Uh, what we do is we represent the product, the winery, the producer. Uh, just, Carl, uh, just like if you're an actor and you have somebody who's trying to get you a gig uh, and they work on a commission basis for getting you into a movie or a play or whatever, uh, whatever the case may be. Yeah, you're it's, an agent. It, that's exactly it. We are agents. <laughs> yeah. And um, Dialogue Wines, the name Dialogue comes from the idea is that uh, when I started this agency is that I wanted to show people wines that were worth talking about, conversation pieces. That was what I was really going for. So hence the name Dialogue Wines. Um, so, you know, we are an agency and we represent uh, several producers from around the world. We really like to focus on uh, French wines. We like to focus on Canadian wines especially the, uh, the boutique uh, family-owned operations, which was really sort of the incentive uh, at the beginning for me because um, there's plenty of what you know you would call industrial wines, which are uh, mass-produced product products, not saying that they can't be enjoyable. There's plenty of good ones. Um, but I really felt as though there was a gap in small boutique wineries, family-owned operations, and uh, for me, that's a big thrill. When I know the, the person who made this wine or the family who's, who's put their heart and soul into the product, um, I think that that's special. And uh, that was the beginning of Dialogue Wines. So how, how do you find your wines? Do you set out to, you know, go after particular <laughs> wines? You say you like French wines. Do you, do you set out to, you know, target specific wineries or do they come to you? Or do you, do you actually fly to France and visit these wineries? How does it work? All of the above, yeah. I mean, sometimes you, you fly to a region, you taste, you're there specifically to to find something that'll work in your portfolio, that'll work in this uh, in this market. Um, but I think you really have to find a balance. When I first started, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it was all about trying to find these kind of niche family-owned boutique operations. Uh, and I thought to myself, if I can taste a good wine, I can sell it, you know, I could find this wine, bring it to Newfoundland, and I can sell it. And I've, I've learned that, that that's not the case at all. You really have to have um, a balance, I think, in, the, in the, your portfolio. You've got to try to find something for everybody. You have to find something that the corporation thinks that they can make money on because at the end of the day, their mandate is to make money for the government. Um, so a lot of the wineries that I would personally love to have here, they just don't really fit with the market. Now, that being said, we, we, we do have a bit of a balance here. We have some of them. But uh, for me, it's tr it's trying to stay true to myself and what I what I want and what I like to drink as a consumer. But then you also have to have products that are going to um, have uh, volume. You know, you, I mean, we're in the business as, as well as uh, of trying to survive and make money. So yeah, just uh, just use your analogy of you know being an agent for an actor. It's it's like you've got to. You've, it's it's nice to have Jeremy Irons as a client. But you've also got to have maybe the Kardashians as well to really make a go of it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and, and that's a great analogy because yeah. uh, Jeremy Irons is obviously a wonderful, a wonderful actor, but <laughs> the right. agents for the Kardashians is probably making a lot more money. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so sometimes you need to have those, uh, let's say, uh, high interest, high volume products uh, in your portfolio. So you know, we certainly have a bit of that. We look for that. Uh, those are the wines that you can go in the liquor store and, and they're readily available all the time because you never have to worry about a production shortage because the production is so big. Mm -hmm. And the liquor corporation likes that too because, of course, the agents, it's our job to create marketing plans for these wines as well to sell within the stores. But we are dealing with alcohol, so we have to play within a very small set of rules or actually perhaps a very big set of rules. Mm -hmm. um, and within those rules, we have to find a way to market the wine the best we can um, and of course do it in an affordable way uh, a lot of people think that uh, there's a misconception i think that because we're selling alcohol we're selling wine we have these deep uh, big budgets and uh, that's certainly not, not the case at all uh, we're not um, you know Molson or Labatt or 
uh, even you know in this market I think lambs would be a, a fair uh, comparison mm -hmm. but you know we don't have these budgets so we've got to find a way to do as much as we can with uh, with very little okay now you've br brought along some of your other wines um, let's uh, let's just talk about uh, each of these now sure so I, I brought along just to sort of touch on some of the um, uh, the different types of wines that you look for when you're trying to find a, a, a massive portfolio, I suppose. So, um, you know, we just tasted Nova 7, and Nova 7 appeals to me, Benjamin Bridge Winery appeals to me because they kind of check every box that I like. They're a family owned operation. Um, the families really put their heart and soul into producing a, a world class product. They're very famous for their uh, sparkling wines that rival some of the best champagnes. Uh, which always surprises people. I love I love pouring the Nova Scotia wine um, next to a champagne for uh, in a blind tasting, and people are always so surprised. Um, they check every box. It's boutique. The family's great to work with. Consumers love it. it it's it's a, it's a wonderful product to have. Um, the next wine you're looking at is um, called Mudhouse uh, Pinot Noir, and Mudhouse is interesting as well because they started off as an independent. Uh, uh, winery in uh, New Zealand and central Otago and eventually were bought out by a uh, international wine company one of the biggest in the world called Accolade so I represent uh, part of the Accolade portfolio here mm -hmm. uh, but the dynamic has changed uh, a little bit and what's interesting is sometimes you still see these families are still working for the winery are still involved but they are actually owned by uh, you know a giant <laughs> um, so that changed the dynamic again a little bit uh, and helps me because I can have, you know, still a, a quality product uh, with a little bit more marketing budget behind it, perhaps because it is owned by a big company. Uh, so Mudhouse kind of fits that description, I think. Well, I'm, I'm kind of um, excited today because uh, apart from the Benjamin Bridge, which I have seen, um, all of these wines are totally new to me. Uh, like this one, for example, Radio Boca. Tell us about this one. <clears throat> Radio Boca. It's it's not very often that a uh, you know we're doing a podcast here, so people can't see the label. But um, it's not very often I'm pulled in by a label. I, I you know I, full disclosure. I think I'm too much of a wine snob to be pull, to be pulled in by a label. But I was at um, Vin Expo, which is a. a, a a huge wine uh, and well expo uh, that takes place every two years in Bordeaux and I was there uh, this past well nearly a year ago last June waiting for a meeting running down the hallway when out of the corner of my eye I saw this massive banner of the Radio Boca label and I had to stop to go over and see what this was all about so I went over I had a quick quick talk tasted some of the wines so wine wine agents are as intrigued by labels as uh, wine customers. <laughs> yeah, there's no question about it. Um, you know, if you have a, a product that looks good on the shelf, uh, you know, we're, we're consumers too. You know, it catches your eye. So um, Radio Boca was uh, an interesting story for me because you don't see a lot of, um, well, let's say branded wines in um, coming out of Spain, really, to these markets. You see a, a lot of wineries like Marquis de Riscal, uh, for example, Emilio Moro for, uh, would be another one where you see the actual, this is the name of the producer, this is the label. Uh, Radio Boca is a, is a brand. You know, it's from uh, the winery's called Hammock and Cellars. They are family owned, but Radio Boca happens to be their biggest production. And it's new here, but it's already selling extremely well. And I like it because of the packaging, the price point, and the wine is uh, very approachable. And I think it appeals to a lot of consumers from the introductory level. Um, consumer to uh, somebody who just needs something casual to have on a, on a Wednesday or Thursday night with their friends or something affordable on the wine list in the restaurant. Now we have two that look uh, exactly the same. I mean, just I'm just looking at the labels here, but obviously they're different. One, well, one is white and one is red. What am I saying? <laughs> tell, us, <laughs> tell us about the uh, white first. Sure. So uh, this is when I get in, this is called Domaine Lafage, and these wineries are French. Um, so these wines are French from a, a small producer in uh, the south of France in a region called uh, Roussillon, which is in around the Mediterranean. And these wines speak to me because they are fairly small, uh, small volume made by um, a guy named Marc Lafage. His, you know, his name is on the label there. And uh, not, a, not a big production, but uh, he's just found a way to make some quality product at a, at a great price. And 
these were presented to me by somebody I work with in France who happens to be the agent for Lafage over there. Um, and I read some reviews on these, and that's something else, Carl. I mean, there's, there's wine critics that can make or break a winery, uh, world-famous critics, and uh, certainly, you know, Wine Spectator, Jancis Robinson, Robert Parker is certainly well-known in this market. And uh, Mr. Parker uh, saw it fit to give these wines from Arc Lafage very high reviews for wines that retail for under $25. Uh, you combine that with a small production. Uh, there's not a lot of Roussillon wines in this market. I think it's, you mentioned that they look new, they look interesting. Um, you know, so that's sort of the, the hope is that you can introduce consumers to a, a relatively, um, well, I'd say new region for this market, um, but maybe something that they haven't tried before. And we're looking at grapes in these wines. You've got Grenache Blanc and uh, something called Roussan in, uh, in the white wine. And then you've got um, uh, Grenache and uh, Grenache uh, Noir in the uh, in the red wine, and and these grapes. Well, I'm not going to say they're they're not common around the world. They're they're fairly common, um, but you don't see a lot of them in the, in this market. So there's uh, I think there could be some appeal there. Uh, now you mentioned uh, Robert Parker thought highly of these wines. He's the guy that marks out of a hundred points, right? So what 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 would he have given these wines, for example? Uh, these wines would have scored in the ninety to ninety two range with uh, with Parker. Uh, for some people, um, you know, they're anti Parkers. They 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 will not bite on a wine because Parker gave it a score. They want to try to evaluate it on their own merit and. Uh, you know, I, I think that's that's great. You should evaluate a wine on its own merit if you have the opportunity to taste it. But the, you know, the other argument, of course, is that you don't have the opportunity to taste these wines all the time, and it's good to have somebody giving you some advice. So if Mr. Parker is going to give a wine essentially 90 out of 100 or, or plus, it makes it very easy for the consumer to um, to roll the dice, you know, to make that investment. Well, I mean, you know, if you like the Parker palate, I mean, if you if you if your palate is similar to Robert Parker's, I guess that's a very good gauge for somebody, right? Yeah, and that, and that's an excellent point as well. I mean, there are critics that you know it's quite possible that your palate is very different than uh, Mr. Parker's. Yeah. You know, well, it's like movies. Uh, I, one of my favorite critics was Roger Ebert, God mm -hmm. rest his soul. But um, you know, there were friends of mine who absolutely uh, hated uh, every movie that Roger Ebert ever uh, recommended. <laughs> they thought he was, you know, completely off base. I never ever saw a movie that Roger Ebert recommended that I didn't like. So I, I, kn I knew that when I read a, a good review from Robert Ebert or um, Roger Ebert that that was going to be a movie I liked. So, so I guess it's the same with wine critics. Yeah, I think that's that's right. I mean, it, it, it's so subjective. And restaurant critics, may I say. Restaurant so. critics, art, art <laughs> critics, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's all subjective. Um, so, you know, again, as an agent, I think that it's important that you try to have something for everybody in your portfolio. You've got to try to appeal to a wide range of audiences. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, it's been great talking to you today, uh, Greg Winter of Dialogue Wines. Um, and uh, if folks want to find out more about you and your company, uh, I assume uh, they can contact you directly? They can, yeah. You can go through our webpage at uh, dialoguewines.com or our Facebook page. We're just Dialogue Wines. Our Twitter handle is at Dialogue Wines. So there's plenty of ways to get in touch with us, and uh, you know we're happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Carl.